One summer, when I was 19 and home on break from college, I decided to join the caring ministry of my local Unitarian Universalist congregation. I was the youngest member of that ministry by 40 years at least. They weren't quite sure what to do with me, which was just as well because I wasn't sure what I was doing either. And the one day the chair of the caring ministry calls me up and asks me to visit Ernie. Ernie was in his 80s. He lived alone. His wife had recently moved into a skilled nursing facility 10 miles away where she received palliative care for the cancer causing her body to waste away. Ernie had been forced to give up driving. His eyesight was failing, and his memory seemed to be following right behind. Ernie's lone visitor most days was the Meals on Wheels delivery person, and I was sent to visit him. Sometimes I drove him the next, to the next town over, taking him to visit his wife. Sometimes we went out for grilled cheese sandwiches at the local diner. But mostly we would go on outings over to the town senior center, which had received a donation of a gorgeous, expensive, mint condition, unused pool table. My first year in college, I had picked up the bad habit of spending too much time in the campus pool hall, major in religion, that you know, minor in pool. <laughs> and Ernie, in his younger years, had been a legitimate, honest-to-God pool shark, professional hustler. You've heard of Tuesdays with Maury. Well, this was Tuesdays and Thursdays with Ernie. We played pool and sat together and ate grilled cheese sandwiches and talked about life and drove over to the next town to pay his wife a visit. There came a point after a few visits when my perspective began to shift. In my mind, these visits changed from a service I was providing, he being the one in need, I being the fulfiller of needs, him receiving me giving, to a friendship in which I came to feel uplifted by his stories, his jokes, his mastery of the pool table, going blind, losing memory about whether he was stripes and solids, a tremor in his hand, and. He beat me. I think he was probably sharking me. <laughs> he was hustle, hustling me. But in the time we spent together, it seemed like my soul had grown. Whatever that means. At a recent meeting of the worship ministry, I asked the members of that ministry to brainstorm with me. I told them I was planning on preaching a sermon called How to Grow a Soul. How to Grow a Soul. And I asked the members of that ministry, what do those words evoke for you? As you consider what those words may evoke for you, listen to how the members of the worship ministry answered that question. One person on the ministry remarked, art is good for the soul. And what specifically came to mind for her was a play that she had seen. It was a play dealing with the span of a century in Native American history. This play was told a tragic and painful history. And yes, it was honest, and yes, it was fearless, but it was also edgy and irreverent and carried with it an unflappable spirit of resistance, and she reflected, seeing that play, my soul grew. Another person on the ministry added that her soul grows when she decides to step out of her comfort zone. She mentioned spending time with homeless women and children at the IFC Women's Shelter, offering English lessons to a young asylum seeker. 
When she mentioned stepping out of her comfort zone, heads nodded. Another person added that what came to mind for him was driving a delivery route with Meals on Wheels. He said that he has really come to look forward to paying visits to these folks. He cares about how they are doing, and he mourns when someone is dropped from his route. Another person mentioned a local organization that works with people with developmental disabilities. This organization throws an annual talent show for its clients at a very fancy theater. This event, going to it, she said, is good for the soul. Another person on the worship ministry mentioned the impact of two trainings she had attended, and one training in particular had to do with crossing socioeconomic boundaries and helped her to reframe her thinking from an advantage-disadvantage, an advantage-deficit model, to a strengths model in which it could be affirmed that all people had ability and strength. One person said quiet, someone else said singing with other people. And I was just about to wrap up this brainstorm and was ready to move ahead to the next thing on the agenda when someone spoke up and said, oh, there's one more thing that I have to add. I think it's important, she said, to recognize pain and loss and grief. Our souls also grow from the crap life brings. The common thread running through much of this brainstorming is that the growth of our soul is related, is connected somehow to the depth of our connection with other people, especially the people from whom we are regularly separated by the structures of the world. The common thread running through much of this brainstorming is that the growth of our soul is related, is connected somehow to the depth of our connection with other people, especially the people from whom we are regularly separated by the systems and structures of the world. As Richard Gilbert put it in our call to worship, we meet on holy ground brought into being as life encounters life, as personal histories merge into the communal story, as we take on the pride and the pain of our companions, as separate selves become community, may our souls capture this treasured time. This being a Unitarian Universalist church, there are probably a number of folks out there this morning who are hoping that I will try to define my terms. <laughs> What is this thing called a soul exactly? And by what unit of measurement is the growth of the soul measured? <laughs> to which I offer probably this unfulfilling analogy. Sometimes for a theologian, pinning down definitions of theological words is like the lepidopterist pinning down butterflies allows us to study them, but it may not be good for the butterflies. <laughs> there is one understanding of the soul that imagines a soul as an aspect of us that is immaterial and immortal, an aspect of human beings and perhaps other beings that is not made out of matter and does not die when we die. And a lot of people get hung up over, on whether that is possible or whether it even makes any sense. But this morning, I don't really want to get into whether a soul exists or not. That question is not the one interesting me that is interesting to me today. There is a different understanding of the soul that I want to put forward, which is even though we may not all agree on whether it exists, we kind of know when we begin talking about it, we have a sense of what we mean by it. To go the negative, when we say something is soulless, what are we saying? That it is emotionally barren? That it does not evoke human feelings? It's not conducive to human flourishing? 
Soullessness is that state of being out of touch with one's own humanity and unable and unwilling to recognize the humanity of others. I think about last year when a number of members of our church took a trip to the Stewart Detention Center in Georgia, one of our country's largest detention centers for undocumented people. It was a soulless place designed to dehumanize. We're familiar with the phrase that someone sold their soul, sold their soul to the devil, even if we don't believe in a soul or a devil. We know what this means, though. It means giving up, giving up some portion of your humanity in exchange for something that you kind of wrongly value more. It is a trade of humanity for fame or power or prestige or material gain. We know what that means. I got to thinking, and I was, I was doing my brainstorming about the soul. I had this moment where what popped into my mind was soul music. And uh, this popped into mind after Glenn had well chosen and scheduled all the music for this morning. <laughs> and, and the music, it does, it does fit. There were so many, did, did anyone notice how many emotions were present in that in that piece, that movement, that, that, that broad emotional palette. But I got to thinking a little earlier this week about soul music, and I wondered why is it called soul music? So I Googled it. <laughs> and I found, and I found this definition, which was so good that I have to include it, and I, it said, blending gospel with rhythm and blues, Soul music erases the boundaries between the sacred and the secular and is characterized by an intensity of feeling and a wide range of emotions. Every place where I went to try to find out what is meant by a soul, I found these two things over and over again. One, the crossing or erasing or blending of boundaries and the expanding of the emotional palette. When I asked the members of the worship ministry to brainstorm with me about how to grow a soul, they mentioned crossing boundaries, being with, being with people whom we stretch ourselves to be with, and they mentioned experiences that led to a wide emotional range. And it's perhaps possible that that's what happened to me on those Tuesdays and Thursdays with Ernie. It was a crossing of boundaries. Not many 85-year-olds shoot pool with 19-year-olds and win every time. <laughs> and the other thing that struck me, thinking back on it, was the emotional range of this time that I spent with him. Where in our time together, we would go from laughing, to tears, to joy, to sadness. One older person, one wise older person said to me once, with the years what I notice most is emotional poignancy, which she then went on to define as the capacity to experience several different emotions all at the same time, to not feel one emotion alone, but to feel them across kind of a broad palette. The poet Wiswaba Szymborska, she says the same thing wisely in her poem that we read part of responsibly this morning. It says, joy and sorrow aren't two different feelings for the soul. It attends us only when the two are joined. Wait, said a member of the worship ministry, the soul also grows in times of pain and loss and grief. Last Sunday, our preacher was Lisa Garcia Sampson. Wasn't she great? 
I've really enjoyed inviting her to preach and getting to know her as she's beginning her ministry. And last Sunday, as I sit, sat listening to her preach, I actually heard some words that I said, oh my goodness, that's the words I was planning to say this week. <laughs> so I'm going to have to write a little bit of a different sermon. But she asked this question of us in this charge to us. She said, what is at stake? What is at stake in this moment? And her answer was, our faith, our spirit, our soul. She quoted Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker as saying, social activism becomes a spiritual practice by which I reclaim my humanity, an act of desire for life. So how do we grow a soul? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the crossing of boundaries, and it has to do with the experience of a, a broader emotional palette. I thought as I wrote of the work of a man named Brian Stevenson, Brian Stevenson is an inspiring individual. It was uh, his work in helping to create the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, that uh, provided the inspiration behind the civil rights bus trip that we're taking later in the spring. Stevenson is the director of the Equal Justice Institute, and his book, Just Mercy, tells the story of his work defending death row inmates. The movie version of his life is playing at the Chelsea Theater right now. And when Brian Stevenson gives speeches, and I've heard him give this speech, he gives two pieces of advice, he gives four pieces of advice, but two of the pieces map extraordinarily well with this idea of gaining a soul. First, he says, to be change agents, we need to, in his words, get proximate. That is, he says, to get closer to the issues we're trying to address and to the people we are trying to empower. Most of us are taught to stay away, but there is a power in proximity. There is a power in proximity. There is a power in proximity. I think back to that member of the worship ministry who said that her soul grows when she decides to step out of her comfort zone. There is a power in proximity. The first thing that Brian Stevenson advises, the first thing that everything that I read pointed to was the idea of stepping outside, stepping through, stepping beyond boundaries. And then the second thing, that Brian Stevenson recommends, the, the, the recommendation that he ends with. He says, do uncomfortable things. He calls on us to make a conscious decision to be willing to go places that bring up stuff within us that are, is uncomfortable for us, including feelings that we would rather not feel. There's that expanding emotional palette, right? How to grow a soul through connections, through getting proximate, through deeper engagement with the wider diversity of the world's people, through challenging our disconnections, the grudges we keep, our reluctance to forgive, our attitudes that keep us separated, and to experience the full palette of emotional experience, to go to that place where joy and sorrow merge in the soul. Life is just a chance to grow a soul, said Unitarian minister A. Pal Davies. Through our connections, through our proximity, through our discomfort, through willing to get uncomfortable, may we continue to grow our souls as well. Amen. And blessed be. Our closing hymn this morning is a hymn about soul, and it's about the emotional palate. It is 
I've got peace like a river, and I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing out hymn number 100. 